at ease. I'm not singing. Um, as we go into the new year, you know, as we studied in Sunday school this morning, James tells us that, you know, faith without works is dead, right? We apply ourselves. We believe. It's impossible to please God without faith, the Word tells us. So as we go into this new year, as we go in and, and, and ask Brother Roger to come up, I'd ask you to search your heart and look if you believe this morning. And if you believe, what are you doing with that belief? What are we doing for God? Uh, to prosper God's, God's calling, to, to do, to go out. Are we doing the Great Commission? Are we helping? Are we doing? Are we valuable? Does God look at us, at us as an asset to do for Him? So I ask you this morning, as, as, as Brother Roger brings the word, to apply ourselves to it. That's going to come right ahead. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you today. And I've already decided that uh, when I have appointments, I'm going to take Todd with me <laughs> to uh, help promote my ministry. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, fan club, whatever. It is true, as you know, I pastored on Marbone for almost 25 years, about 24 and a half years. So uh, we're not a stranger to this area. We've had the opportunity to visit up and down Elkhorn Creek, uh, surrounding areas. There's probably not a hotter over in Marbone area than I have been up and down. I believe in active visitation. I believe in going out and compelling people to come in that God's house may be filled. Amen? And uh, that's my way of looking at it. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a young whippersnapper, as you can tell. <laughs> I've pastored churches for 40-some years. I've worked in the coal mine, pastoring these little small churches. Uh, still have a job in the mining industry, and the job that I have now, they don't like to see me come, but they like to see me go. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm a federal mine inspector also, but don't hold that against me, okay? But mainly, we have come this morning to worship the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms 150, it says, Let everything that hath breath... Praise ye the Lord, right? So when we come into the house of God, it should be an honor and a privilege to assemble in the house of God. And we've come for one specific reason, and that's to lift up the name of God Almighty. Naturally, we Christians, we have this blessed hope of the Jesus Christ is going to come in the near future, and we do not know the day, we do not know the hour. But I want to share some scriptures with this morning. He's gone to heaven. And as he's gone to heaven to prepare a place for all of those who want to be followers, all those who want to go. We're not going to go by doing good works. Just like our brother said, faith without works is dead. It's a work in faith. It's a work in faith when you get up on Sunday and go to the house of God. Amen. It's a work in faith when you get into a good Bible study and start studying God's Word. Is that not true? So you see, there's, there's a lot to this thing. But we'd like to share with you this morning about this place called heaven and I'd like to share with you about the last words that were spoken by Jesus before he ascended up in heaven. Now he spoke to others, he spoke to others later on. As you will recall, they stoned Stephen to death, and after they stoned Stephen to death in the street, Jesus Christ was uh, sitting on the right hand side of God, our intercessor, our, uh, our high priest. And when Stephen's spirit left his body, Jesus stood up to receive it. Amen. He also spoke to Saul on the road to Damascus later on, and he called Saul, the Scripture says, to become a Gentile preacher. So here as we look at Scripture this morning in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1 is the establishment of the New Testament church. We can't go back in the old Bible and get the New Testament church because it's not there. It's founded upon the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Him. Amen? So let's look. If you've got your Bible with you and like to turn, Acts chapter 1, I'm going to be reading verses 1 down through uh, probably verse 12. And it says, The former treaties have I made, O Theolopidus, of all that Jesus Christ began both to do and to teach. Unto the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, 
to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Now look at this. He told them to abide in Jerusalem until they be endowed with power from on high. Right? Uh, a special power, an anointing power. And that's exactly what they did here. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And I've always said, the first baptism we receive is when the Holy Spirit of God convicts your heart that you're lost on the road to hell. And when you surrender that call, you receive the baptism of the Spirit of God. Is that not true? And he says, And one day therefore will come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, now look at this. Lord, when wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Look at this. So many people today are saying, the Lord's going to come back on a certain day, a certain hour, and he's going to come back just for this group or just for that group. But let me share something with you this morning. No one knows the day or no one knows the hour when the Lord's going to come back. And he says in verse 7, he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father put in his own power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, and all Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Gave, he's here he's given a great commission. The main purpose is to be the witness that he wants us to be, right? And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This son, now look at this. This same Jesus which is taken from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He said, look at this. God came down as he came a cloud of glory, wrapped him up, and took him back to heaven. Is that not true? He suffered, he bled, he died, he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he arose victoriously. Then they returned to Jerusalem to the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey, or actually less than a mile, because under the law they could not, they actually could not travel, uh, uh, my friend, uh, a whole mile. But look at this. Here is the establishment of the New Testament church. They met in the upper room, and it names the names of those that were there, the, the apostles, the disciples that were there. And the scripture says they continued with one accord in prayer. The main focus we need to realize today on the New Testament church, we need to be a people that is one mind, one accord. One mind, one accord, we get things accomplished. Get self out of the way and put God in there and start doing things for His honor and His glory. Amen. I'd like to share something with you this morning. I love to preach about heaven, and I know I probably wore my family out with this. I preached on this also. I'll be preaching uh, next Sunday at Kemper. But uh, like I said, I'd like to share something with you about uh, the truth ministry. And what is the empty space behind the North Star? And I have my compass here. Which direction is north? Which direction is south? Which direction is east? And which direction is west? Now look at this. NASA came out with this several years ago. And in recent years, there's been much speculation as what exactly is behind the North Star, the Polaris. It's described as NASA as actually three close stars. And they say behind this star is actually an empty space. Well, behind this star, it says there's an empty place. Look at this. Polaris is not the brightest star in the nighttime sky, as you commonly believe. Polaris is only about 50th brightest. But yet, on a stormy night, spotting the North Star in that way, knowing the direction north, had gladdened the hearts of many. And if you've ever been out, if you've ever been in the military, and if you've been out in land navigation, I was in Korea about 16 months. If you've ever been out there, you'd be surprised how that you're dependent upon that North Star for guidance. How does this compass that we have know the magnetic field that's drawing us toward the North? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about that? How many has been in the Boy Scouts or in the Army, in the military, right? You're dependent upon that. The, the Navy, primarily out on the sea. 
Well, look at this. I want to share something with you this morning. What is that empty space? Well, now over in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse number 20, Moses said, he talks about the first heaven, okay, the first heaven. And God said that the waters bring forth abundantly, the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Well, heaven number one is, I'm able to look out and I see a bird fly. Right? You can see it with a natural eye. See the bird fly. Well, we come on over now. Let's think, if you will, maybe, about uh, Psalms 19, if you'd like to turn. In Psalms 19, the Scripture says this, that uh, stars in the sky begin to actually begin heaven number two. Right? You ever been out on the front porch swinging in a swing and looking up and you're able to see the stars, right? Hmm? I don't know about you, when I was uh, actually courting my wife, we sat on the porch when we were in the house. Well, look at this. Looking at the beauty of the creation of God. Okay, and look at this. Heaven number two. Notice what the psalmist David says. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day, other speech, night unto night, showeth his knowledge. Now look at this. David said, we've been able to, look, eight, able to look out and see. We can see the first heaven. We can see the second heaven. We can see the stars in the sky, the beauty of the creation of God Almighty, right? And I don't know about you, but I thank God that He just spoke everything into existence. Did He not? Well, now let's turn over, if you will, to the book of 2 Corinthians. Book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul speaks in reference to the third heaven, does he not? Have you read it? We're going to read it for you, okay? Notice what it says. Chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such a one called up where? To the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth how he was called up into Paradise and heard unspeakable words was not law for, for a man to utter. Look at this. The Apostle Paul, it was hard for him to relate to actually the experience he was actually having, the spiritual experience he was having. But the scripture says he was caught up to third heaven. Well, think with me for this moment. When Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, one of the thieves looked over at him and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, What? This day, thou shalt be with me, where? In paradise. So we've been given the assurance, I don't know about you, we're saved and are on our way to a place called heaven. And we're going to get there because over 2,000 years ago, God sent the best of the heaven out to offer, and that was His Son, Jesus Christ, and He came and made the way for us to get there. This whole world, my friend, is just a place where we can get ready, my friend, to meet Him when He comes, right? So the Scripture says here, and let's read a little bit more about Paul. And he says, look at verse 5, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Look at verse number 6. And though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And look at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, the abundance of the revelation that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now Paul is actually saying here, I could have come back and I could have exalted myself and I could have said, well, I got a glimpse of what's up there. I got a glimpse of up there and he could get self-exalted. A lot of people do that a lot of times. Amen. But listen, he didn't do that. Why? Because he said God gave him a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of certain of uh, Satan to buffet him to ask my friend keep him in his place. Now we need to be very careful when it comes to praising God and glorifying God. Anything that's accomplished, my friend, my friend, give God the honor, God the glory, and God the praise for it, my friend, and get man out of the way. Is that not true? So that's exactly, now Paul, if you study Paul, and I'm sure you probably have, Paul was a bishop over the churches. Paul, as you will recall, he set the churches up, and after the churches were set up, two-thirds of the New Testament was authored by Paul, letters of instruction back to that church on how that church, what that church should do. If you want to follow the teachings of the New Testament church, you read the books of the, of the Apostle Paul and how, my friend, letters of instruction that were given, my friend, by him back to the church. 
Well, I got another one to share with you. Job 26 and 7 says, He stretched out the north over the empty space, and he hangeth the earth on nothing. Look at this. God, he just placed the earth out there, and it's not hanging on anything. It's only the birth and mercies of God. We haven't already been consumed. We've come so far away from God. We've all, the scripture says, we've all actually turned our back on him. Is it not true? So this, as we look here, Job says he stretched out the north over this empty place and he hanged the earth on nothing. Well, look at this. The psalmist said, beautiful for situation is a joy. The whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Let me tell you something. God is a processor of heaven. God will always be God. My friend, we might get mad a lot of times and think, well, why did this happen or why did that happen? I'll guarantee you, my friend, when the last song has been sung, when the last testimony has been given, God will still be God Almighty and He'll be sitting on His throne in glory and we'll still be dependent upon Him for everything. Amen. To Him be honor and glory. I've got a little Pentecost on me. Don't hold it against me. You know what I'm saying? But look at this. When we think about these things, and think about the joys that we've got. So look at this. As we look out there, look, look toward the north. Honey, let me tell you something. There's that final resting place. You ever seen these people come by selling you a cemetery spot and say that's your final resting place? Honey, that's not a Christian final resting place. That's just temporary until the Lord comes back. Is that not true? The body's going to be released when the Lord comes back. But look at this. We have a home in glory that outshots the signs of sun, and by faith in Christ, we're certainly going to be there one day after a while. Well, look at this, my friend. Let's go back now to a very familiar passage of Scripture in the 14th chapter of the book of St. John. Well, John says this, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. We're not so, but I've told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive to myself that where I am there you may be also. You know right now he's preparing a place for every born again Christian? And I'll tell you something else. The table has already been set. <laughs> You're going to emerge. The church is going to be married, my friend, to Christ. And he's going to take that church, and according to Jude 24, how many have read Jude 24? Praise God, shall these hands going up? Look at this. Look at this. We look at one another now, we see in one another's imperfections. If you live with your wife, you can point out her things that's not right. She can look at you and do the same thing. I've been married 51 years, thank God for my wife. Amen. Let me share something with you this morning. According to Scripture, and I believe it's all my heart, Jesus Christ will escort the church into the throne of glory, and my friend, he'll look up to God Almighty, and he'll present the church as a chaste, young, virgin bride to God Almighty. Jude 24 says he'll present you blameless. Think about it. Blameless? Somebody like me? He'll present you blameless by the authority of what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. Presented blameless. Isn't that good? Give God a hand of praise. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Because if I got justice, I'd be in hell. I don't know about you. My friend, when we think in reference to what we have, and to the devil that keeps us beat down, not wanting to exercise our faith in God. Let me tell you something. A lot of people want to go on how they feel. We're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not the works that demands you boast. Don't get me wrong, good spiritual feeling comes to your heart. I can shout with the breast of them. But let me tell you something. Some days I don't feel very well. That doesn't mean that I'm not saved. It doesn't mean it just means I just don't feel good. Might not look good either. I don't know. But you know what I'm saying? We're saved by grace through faith. We put our faith and our trust in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we look at this, God, we thank you that we got a place in heaven. And uh, so many, so many wonder a lot of times, well, why did this happen or why did that happen? Let me tell you something. God's got everything already worked out. Now, the one that's going to give us the most problems, I'm going to share some scriptures with you. I hope you don't mind me sharing scriptures with you this morning. I'm just old-fashioned in country, and I am what I am. You know what I'm saying? I don't, uh, you know what I'm saying? 
Like I said, I've pastored little small churches over in Harlan County. I've run up and down the road over there. Lee County, Virginia, I've pastored churches over there. I've pastored churches here in Pike County. Let me tell you something. It's to God be the glory, my friend. It's not you. It's not me. It's for Him. And it's, it's all for Him. And I'll tell you something else. I believe also. The devil is walking around like a roaring lion. He's deceiving so many people. His eternal destination, according to the book of Revelation, is a lake of fire and brimstone. Is it not true? Let me share something with you. My friend, as he looks upon us, he is able to see our weak points. And he knows how to pull us down. My friend, uh, a lot of times things happen, my friend, and we just, we just have to still look to God and put our faith and our trust in him. But I want to share some scripture with you uh, this morning over in the book of Isaiah, talking in reference to Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Thou art cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation on the side of the north. The devil knows what's on the side of the north, church. I will ascend above the height to the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Satan... My friend, try and exalt himself above the throne of God Almighty. I'm not saying I understand all this, but let me share something with you this morning. The devil was cast out of heaven, and a third of the angels was cast out with him. Hell was prepared for the devil and his fallen angels. Is that not true? Have you read your Bible? Right? So, my friend, there is a literal burning hell. People who die without Jesus Christ today, as soon as the Spirit departs from their body, they drop into a literal burning hell. Church, we got a job to do, have we not? It's not His will that any perish, but all come to repentance. Let me tell you something. When we think about Christmas time, this time of year, and we think about John 3 and 16, it says, For God so loved. Think about it for this moment. God's love is unconditional. Right? He, loved the, he loves the lowest of the low. There is not a person, my friend, living today that God don't love. And that God won't forgive. And that God will not save if they simply call on His name. So you see, my friend, we put our faith and our trust in Him. The devil is out there. He's causing division in churches. He, he don't want churches to get fired up for God. My friend, you start getting fired up for God, you better watch out. The devil's going to pay you a visit. He's going to try to pull you down any way you can. That's where we just need to come down, hit an old-fashioned altar, and say, God, send the anointing that's needed. I'm old-fashioned. I believe in divine healing. I've seen it with my own eyes. I believe in anointing with oil, praying for the sick. And I believe, my friend, if we get to where God can use us for His honor and glory, we'll see more miracles happen by putting our faith and our trust in Him. Amen? But as I look at this today, I believe when we think about this North Star, when we think about this empty space, <laughs> it's not going to be empty long because God is going to tell Jesus Christ it's time to go get my people. Right now, Jesus Christ is sitting on the right hand of the side of God in glory. We can't even pray to God without going through the name of Jesus. Right? So he's, he's sitting on the right hand side of God in heaven. But you see, I believe that God's going to give him a command in the future and say, it's time. Go get my people. And when he receives that command, eastern sky is going to roll back. Jesus Christ will make his appearing. And as, as the eastern sky rolls back, Jesus has with him every spirit that's ever died in Christ. Amen? How many of you got loved ones went on home to be with him in glory? We all do, don't we? Well, think about that for just a moment. He's going to come to the eastern sky this time, bring him back with him the spirits of all those who died in Christ, and there certainly is going to be a resurrection. Well... The spirits of all these that he brought back in the eastern sky will enter back down to these bodies. That body will be changed in a moment, caught to meet the Lord in the air. And the scripture says, Then we which are alive remain will be changed, will be caught to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever, so shall we ever be with the Lord. If that don't fire us up, there's something wrong. You know what I'm saying? Look at this. Like I said, it's the devil that keeps you beat down all the time. It's the devil, my friend, allowing certain things to happen a lot of times. 
saying you're no good, say God don't love you, God can't use limitations. There's not a person today that God can't take and use for his honor and his glory. Mordecai Ham, who was an evangelist, was in revival down the Carolinas. And as they were singing the imitational hymn, they quit. Mordecai looked over at the song leader and he said, sing one more verse. There's somebody in here going to get saved. They sang one more verse. And when they sung that one more verse, here come a young man by the name of Billy Graham. Let me tell you something. That man's ministry has went all over the world. They tried to dig up dirt on him. They can't dig nothing all up on him, my friend, because he stood on what thus saith the Word of God. You never know who's out there. You never knew. Let me share something with you also. God can only use a willing. You can line these walls with degrees. You can brag about how long you've been in the ministry. You can brag about how many churches that, uh, that you pastored and all these things. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. My friend, his to God be the glory. When we start thinking we're something, be very careful, right? Why? Well, the Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. And the Bible also brings it out real clear as we think in reference to Ecclesiastes 7 and 20, there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Every year, I, I'm just a young preacher and been out on visiting over in Virginia years ago, and I, I came up on the door, knocked on this door of this house, and there was two ministers in there, and they told me that they lived above sin. Well, that tore me all to pieces because, I, like I said, I was young, and I said, well, I live above sin. I said, uh, best I do, I sin. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, a lot of times uh, when you go to bed at night, you're liable to have a dream you shouldn't have or something like that. Best I do, I sin. And I just came to the realization, it doesn't matter who we are, we all have sinned or are going to sin, that's just the way it is. We live from the old Adamic flesh, is that not true? Well, all that sin, there's no just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Uh, and uh, we think in reference, my friend, to Romans 3 and 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. We can't blow your horn and say, I'm better than this person, or I don't sin here, I don't sin there, because we all sin. And we need forgiveness of sin. Well, the only way to get forgiveness of sin is get it, what? Under the blood. Is that not true? Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. Verse number 9 says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession, my friend, our sin unto him. I used to, I was raised in a little old country church home in Virginia, and an old country preacher used to be up there preaching, and I'd come and get saved and confess his sins, and I'd think to myself, Lord, have mercy, these people ain't going to stay here that long. Because I got a lot of sin. But let me share something with you. All you got to do is say, to me, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come to my heart and save my soul. And if you mean it from your heart, you're forgiven as soon as those words are spoken. Right? So he says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. And then the Bible says, and I quoted in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, and he said, For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. We're saved, church, unto good works. Right? We're, uh, let me tell you, my good works wouldn't move, out, move me off this platform. I'm saved unto good works. I'm saved because God saw fit to save me. Praise his own name. Let me share something with you also. How many were saved in the house, not in the church? Anybody? I was saved in my house. You saved your house, you know. I took my wife and my son to church, and I came back and turned the television on. And as I turned the television on, I, I loved to hear Rex Humbard preach out of Akron, Ohio. This is probably before a lot of you were born. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. But I loved hearing him preach. And he preached a message that morning, conviction message, uh, convicted me. And I went to church as a lost man, and when I came back to pick my family up, I came back a saved man, my friend. God can save you regardless of where you're at. In the house, on the hilltop, it doesn't matter, right? So look at this. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works as in man should boast. We're saved unto good works, right? 
We don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved, my friend. Stay out. Stay in the Great Commission. Go out and make disciples of all mankind, right? Well, then he says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says this, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou what? Shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth... Confession is made unto salvation. You Look at this. You're picking up that righteousness there that you don't have that was placed upon Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. That's how we're made righteous. And I love verse 13. You know, I, like I said, I've pastored churches over the years, and uh, it's sad but true. Everybody's not welcome in a lot of churches. Let that settle in for just a minute. You mean to tell me that we're going to allow that bunch to come to our church? I've heard that statement made in church. Romans 10 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? Right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done. Like I said, God's love is an unconditional love. He loves, look at this, He loves me in spite of myself. You know what I'm saying? I'll, let me share something with you. Living a Christian life, the one a lot of times is going to give you the most problems is when you want to go in and look in the mirror. Think about that. Look in the mirror at the person you're looking at. How can I do better? It's not how this other person can do better. How can I do better? How can I get closer to God? How can I do, God, what you want me to do? But look at this. Heaven is real. You believe that? Well, according to, let me share something else with you. Might be another message. Might be able to come back sometime and get into that. I don't know. But uh, when we think in reference to knowing one another in heaven, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what is it, about the latter part of verse 13 maybe, we will know as we are known. Right? Think about it. We will know as we are known. Well, I don't know about you. But I can't help but believe that when we're escorted into the marriage supper table, like I said, your plate has already been set. This is where you're going to sit. You're working on that place now by faith in Christ, what we're doing for Him. Jesus Christ has caught you over to that plate. This is where you're going to sit, my friend. You're going to sit down there, and He's going to serve everyone that's seated at that table. And I can't help but believe we have the opportunity to look right across the table there are not be any marrying or giving in marriage in heaven, but we all will be the children of God. And we'll see loved ones. <laughs> that we knew in this walk of life, having a different relationship, but we know them, church. This thing is real. This thing is real. I think about growing up in the hills over there in Virginia, and Grandpa, uh, he, he was, uh, my grandpa was a primitive Baptist, and uh, when he come home from church on Sunday, you know what a lot of those people do, honey? They bring the church with them, honey. You better have plenty of food to, to cook in the kitchen. And we go in that old country kitchen there in that big long table. To me, it looked like it's a mile long. And aunts and sister-in-laws and dear friends would start setting that table. They would feed everybody that came in. And the marvelous thing about it, they never run out of food. Are you with me? <laughs> it put me in mind. But in mind of the lad that had the fish and the honeycomb. Think about it for this moment. Think about it. But look at this. We can eat from God's table. We can rejoice because we're Christians. Don't let the devil keep you bit, beat down most of the time. Have faith in God. I'm going by faith. Faith is, faith is the sum of things hoped for. And he said the evidence of not things not seen. It's by faith. Our faith is in him. Our faith is that He's coming again. Our faith is that He cares for each and every one of us. And He does. Let me ask you a question. How many hairs you got in your head? I don't know, but every time I comb my hair, it seems like I lose some. You know what I mean? He still knows how many you got left in your head. Right? Is that not true? Well, think about this. You talk about rewards in heaven. And Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water... In the name of the Lord, you will not lose your reward. Hmm? Think about that for just a moment. A cup of cold water 
in the name of the Lord, you're going to have reward in heaven. In other words, caring for one another. In other words, how can I help? How can I help? If you have a need, how can I help? I don't know about you, but we need to, go, we need to follow old-fashioned roots a lot of times that were set down by our forefathers. Uh, caring for one another and helping one another and doing what we can as we go through this walk of life. We don't know what we're going to face from one day to another. But anyway, I just wanted to share those with you this morning. That's what God laid on my heart. Like I said, I'm just an old-fashioned country preacher. Uh, and uh, I thank God that He called me to preach His Word. And I love preaching His Word. And I, I, I pray that He'll use us, church, the way He wants us to heal. He'll be glorified, right? Where souls will be saved. Isn't that the most important thing? Get them saved. He said, well, a lot of folks get into this. Boy, if you're not in our little group, you ain't a-going. If you ain't part of this, you ain't a-going. If you ain't been baptized this way, you ain't a-going. Romans 10 and 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Nutshell, right? That's it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We'd like to ask you a personal question this morning. But if you're here this morning, anyone, you've never been saved by the amazing grace of God, and you desire the prayers of Christian people. You desire to be saved. I'm going to ask you in the stillness of this moment. Just simply raise your hand. You can take it right back down. And all you're doing is simply saying, I stand in need of prayer. I'm not a Christian. I pray that everyone is. I'm not a Christian. I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior. Is everybody saved this morning? Everybody saved. You might be here this morning, and as we begin this new year, you might want to say, Lord, I want to be a better witness for you. I want to do things that I haven't been doing. I want to stop some things that I have been doing. But I want to serve you as I go into this new year. And you just want to raise that hand and say, God, look down upon me. You know my life. You know me actually better than the